larger challenges loom on the state level in 2011. The state has a projected budget deficit of over $2 billion in 2011, and there's a need for job growth and economic vitality. We stand ready as the GMC to be helpful in any way we can, Governor-elect. We know it's a hectic time, and we also know that you are not making many of these appearances, and so we appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your very busy schedule to join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, the Governor-elect. Good afternoon. Thank you, for the, uh, thank you for the introduction, Marilyn. Thank you for your leadership on so many levels, not only here at the GMC, but uh, in multiple institutions throughout the community. It is, uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm, uh, I have one of these dual jobs. All of you do wear many hats. Today I spent my time in the morning in the courthouse, and I'm going to spend my afternoon in the Capitol. Um, I'm going to meet right after this with the Assembly uh, Republican Caucus. Tomorrow I'll be meeting with the Assembly Democratic Caucus. Last week I met with the Senate Republicans, and, and uh, because the Senate Democrats were in the midst of a, of a uh, leadership battle, they asked me to come for the second one so I wouldn't get in the midst of, of all that. But uh, Mark Miller and I had a good discussion yesterday on the way up to the Packers game. So we're hopeful in, in literally the days since and uh, early on in January when all the new members of the Assembly and half the members of the Senate and I and the other constitutional officers uh, take the oath of office, that we can start out right away in a way that immediately gets things done, particularly when it comes to business, and get things done in a way that I hope will involve not just the new Republican majorities, but on many of these important issues can involve a fair amount uh, of Democrats as well. Because when it comes to jobs and the economy and loving the state, there's not a partisan premium on that. It's something where on many of these issues we can reach across party lines and get done. So I thought I'd share a little bit of that in a moment. First off, I just want to tell you transition-wise, and that's not the reason why Mike's gone today. Uh, he's got his board of directors in, but uh, Mike Grevy, as you know, a great leader in this community. I tapped uh, yet again last week to be our transition chair, um, and he's, uh, as you might guess, with Mike's diligence, is not taking that lightly, is actually going to carve out a fair amount of his time to play an active uh, role in doing that. Uh, along with our transition staff headed out uh, by John Hiller and other staff that have been assembled in the Capitol. Uh, that is something uh, we take quite seriously and know that it's a little bit nicer. The transition I had as county executive was literally six days. Uh, so even though it's a short amount of time, having about two months to be involved in the transition gives you a little bit more time, not really to take a breath, but to really sort out and make sure you're making wise and prudent decisions so that the minute uh, we hit the ground running after the oath of office, we're ready to roll. And uh, for us, it means not only putting in uh, Mike as the chair, but we've got a series of groups uh, that are going to be reaching out to folks all across the state from here and in, in, in every area of the state of Wisconsin uh, in a couple of key categories. Uh, one, uh, no surprise, is going to be uh, looking at, at jobs and our jobs agenda and how to help implement major portions of that uh, in the first days that we take office. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a moment. But it's really about taking that jobs initiative I've talked about a special session that we'll be calling and talking about not only what's in there, but how we work across party lines to get as many votes for that uh, as aggressively as possible early in our legislative session. Secondly, we're going to be talking about the state budget, which I'll expand on in a moment here as well, uh, certainly with about a $3 billion budget gap to make up. That is a significant challenge. We can't wait until February when the budget comes out. We can't even start waiting until January 3rd. We're starting to work on it as of last week. Uh, on the 3rd of November, I was already over with uh, the Legislative Fiscal Bureau and with the State Budget Director getting briefings on the latest status as to where revenues are projected and other things like that, uh, because we don't want to wait until January to get working on that. And then the other big uh, component, you all know, with the organizations and companies that you lead, that personnel uh, can make or break an organization. That's certainly true when it comes to the government. And so we've got a group working on the Cabinet cabinet appointments, and, and in this case, we have, at least what I've found in the last couple of days, a unique opportunity, not only for uh, cabinet members in terms of secretaries, state agencies, but really, as many of you who work with state government know before, it's not just the secretary, it's the deputy and the executive assistant. Uh, we have really one of those unique opportunities to put in place people in all three of those positions who represent a good cross-section of the people of the state, uh, diversity not only in terms of race and gender, uh, but also in terms of, of different parts of the state of Wisconsin, different backgrounds, from people who may have had a, a career in politics, career in government, to people who've never set foot in government but come from the private sector, 
the people who have a mix in all those categories, and we're going to try and integrate that in a way uh, that best suits the needs and interests of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, the great news for us is we've had people come out of the woodwork uh, beyond just people we thought might be interested, but many others who have expressed an interest to step up and be part of the best and the brightest uh, that we have uh, are able to assemble to put together a great administration for the state, not just for me, but for the people of the state of Wisconsin. So watch for more details about that. But those groups will be reaching out to folks from all parts of the state of Wisconsin to tap into expertise when it comes to personnel, when it comes to our jobs initiative, and certainly when it comes uh, to preparing for the next state budget process. Having said that, again, a couple, couple key categories. Right off the bat, you saw it on Tuesday night. If you saw any of our, any of our uh, victory night speeches, instead of having my name or the brown bag or anything on the front, uh, we, I very deliberately and personally picked out the sign I wanted on the front of our podium and above my head. It wasn't about me because the election wasn't about me. It was about the people of the state, I believe, are wanting to chart out a new course. And so the message was very simple. Wisconsin is open for business. Uh, I'm going to say that repeatedly. Uh, I used to say I was going to say it like a, I sound like a broken record, but having two high school sons, they remind me that nobody their age knows what a record is anymore. <laughs> so I guess I'm going to sound like a repeating iPod or something like that. But uh, Wisconsin is indeed open for business. Um, many of you know this, and, and the GMC through the Milwaukee 7 has played an active role in already over the last few years preparing for that. But uh, in fact, I call for the M7 on Wednesday morning going to Madison. Um, just made a follow-up call to that same company today, and I will keep calling until I get personally connected to that CEO. And if I have to go down there and drive myself, I will go down there and make the plea to come here uh, just like I called, and actually I had a dinner about a month before the election uh, with a company from, uh, a CEO from a company from uh, St. Paul who was a little concerned about who the next governor in that state might be and who was interested in one of the things I had mentioned about the possibility of proposing giving a, a break to corporations that would bring their business in from another state on corporate income taxes for a year or two. He wanted to see me face to face to see if I was serious about that, and I am. And then he said, well, let's talk after the elections going into January. Uh, I called him two days ago and said, when can we meet? Um, because whether it's coming over the St. Croix, whether it's coming up over the state line from the south, we have some unique opportunities and a clear message to send employers in those states as well as our employers here that, indeed, Wisconsin is open for business. And we're going to chart out a new course, a new direction, a new philosophy about saying we want our employers to feel welcome not only welcome to be here, but welcome to grow here and expand here. And that's something we're going to lay out a very clear, a very clear course on in the future. One of the best ways I think we can do that is literally uh, in the first days we're in office. After I take the oath of office, uh, I'm going to uh, declare an economic emergency, which gives us the ability uh, technically to call a special session even before the next budget. In doing so, it's part of where I'm reaching out to members of, of both parties and both the chambers right now. Uh, to try and incorporate things that they'll find of interest as well as the things that we ran on that we believe can send an immediate and aggressive message to employers, particularly for small businesses to begin with. Because any of the numbers I've seen have shown anywhere from two-thirds to 80 percent of the new jobs that will be created in the next coming years are going to come from small businesses. I want to send an immediate message that we're going to put not only greater emphasis on them, but, but in many ways when we talk about changes in the tax burden, I'd like to put more money back in the hands of our small businesses so they can reinvest in capital and ultimately in, in making more, uh, more people employed in our state and in this region. Uh, that's something that's tremendously important. Along with that, we're looking to make changes when it comes to the regulatory and litigation climate in the state. Again, something um, I know when, when I read the, small business, or the business journal and, and uh, look at small business issues out there and I hear from folks all across the, the state, Small businesses time and time again say it's not only the tax burden, it's the regulatory and litigation climate in the state. The more we can send the message that things are favorable, that things are no longer the government standing in the way, but quite contrary, the government is willing to step forward and be aggressive in helping our businesses. I think that sends a tremendous message. And it's one where one of the things, and I don't know how, how all of you have, have found this to be in the last couple of years, but I know on the campaign trail, one of the things I found that was refreshing, certainly there are a lot of people and there's a lot of businesses hurting out there, but one of the things I found refreshing that gave me that sense of optimism that we could hit our overall goal of creating 250,000 jobs by 2015 is the fact there's a lot of businesses in a holding pattern, a lot of businesses that were waiting to see what was going to happen next. Certainly a fair amount of that goes to the federal health care mandate 
but a significant amount tying into the regulatory litigation and tax climate in this state and wondering what was going to happen to them next. And, and I think we've already seen the fruits of some of that just in terms of a, of a, a relief as to knowing not even just by party, but knowing some certainty as to what's going to happen now that the elections have occurred, looking ahead to what might happen next. Uh, for me, I'd like to break that log jam, tell those employers that you not only have, we're going to remove the barriers, but you're going to have an ally in the governor's office and an ally in state government. I think that gives us a tremendous opportunity um, to start helping businesses employ people here in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, so we're going to be aggressive at doing that, everything from changes in regulation litigation even simple things like repealing the state tax on health savings accounts. We're one of four states that still has that. It's certainly not the magic uh, bullet for every issue that affects health care costs, but it's just one more tool that we can give our small businesses to tackle uh, the challenges they face uh, uh, with, with health care, with regulation and litigation costs out there. So we're going to be aggressively moving down that path. Another thing we're going to do as well is be very aggressive in marketing. And this is something where, <clears throat> again, the M7 staff has already helped us out. And uh, we'll appreciate that, whether it's the M7, the New North, uh, you name it, organizations like that across the state. Uh, I'm not afraid to pick up the phone. In fact, I've told my staff, if I have a moment free in the car and I'm not making a phone call, they're not doing their job. Uh, because whether it's the transition now or along the way, I, I don't plan on traveling anywhere at any time where if there's a call to be made to a would-be employer or someone who wants to expand jobs in the state, I want to be on the phone making that call. And so for all of you here, not just to the M7, but everybody in the GMC, uh, because you represent companies, organizations, unions, and others who have a vested interest in getting us working again as well, uh, let us know. We're going to be shedding, uh, spreading, I should say, uh, through Julie and the staff, but we'll let you know the transition staff and then subsequently the governor's office staff. Uh, but, but seriously, uh, pass those words on. Uh, we made that first call on Wednesday morning uh, per request. We're going to continue to make that. And if you've got leads, if you've got ways of, of personally passing that information on, uh, we will follow up with that, not just to push that off to the Secretary of Commerce, uh, but I want to be actively engaged as the person who is the primary uh, supporter, instigator, cheerleader, you name it, whatever it might be, of creating more economic opportunity here in this state. So I leave you with that part with a charge, uh, not just to know what we're doing, but to help us out along the way. Uh, the other big thing we're going to be faced with is obviously the, the state budget. You know, Governor Doyle two years ago faced a tremendous challenge. Um, some of that uh, w was taken on through some significant cuts in the state bureaucracy. Other parts of it were dealt with in part, at least through a, a little bit over $2 billion in federal stimulus aid. Now, obviously, the state doesn't have that uh, available to us, so the nearly $3 billion we're looking at is something that's going to have to be de dealt with in a, in a way that really is going to require some significant changes. Uh, now, I've said repeatedly at the county that great challenges bring great opportunities. Uh, and I believe that. Uh, I believe that very much so. I think for many years, even predating this current administration, uh, we've had a challenge when it came to state government and the budget where many times, more often than not, the, the issues weren't dealt with. The can was just kicked into the next biennium. They just pushed it off to the next two years. You know, the last couple cycles, we've had the, uh, the stimulus money, and before that, some changes with transportation uh, funding and the patient compensation fund. That Before that, it was the tobacco fund. Before that, it was deferring school aid payment. It's not a Republican or Democrat issue. It's been done by administrations across the board. We can't do it anymore. You know, time has caught up with us. And so we're going to have to make some significant changes. Uh, in part, it's going to mean turning uh, to state employees, many of whom are outstanding people. And you're you're going to hear some confusion out there somehow assuming that I don't care much for government employees, and that's not true. There are great people who work in government. But you can no longer have, and I've said this at the county uh, as well, you can't have a society where the public employees are the haves and the taxpayers who foot the bills are the have-nots. The public employees can't be the untouchables. And so we're going to propose a series of changes that get wages and benefits, particularly benefits on both the retirement and the health care side, more in line with where the private sector is at, more in line with where the people who are footing the bills are at, and that's something I believe will help us not only balance this next budget, but will help us balance budgets for years to come. Uh, because as you all know, looking at GM and Chrysler and other uh, national examples that we've seen, if you don't tackle legacy costs, you just defer the problem to the future and it catches up to you when the economy takes a dive. We can't have that anymore here in Wisconsin. I knew Shell would like that. Uh, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, you've seen it in the past, not just here. 
but in other parts of the country. If you don't tackle those issues, uh, they're going to come back to bite you, and it's only going to be worse. And if we, for all the things we care about, public safety, education, higher education, a safety net for people when it comes to health care, if you don't tackle those fundamental legacy cost issues, you just make it more difficult to support those quality of life services in the future. We want to be able to do that. We're going to chart that course out in this next budget. Along with that, since a significant portion of the state's budget is aid back to local governments, of which the vast, vast majority is to schools, and we have to empower our local governments, particularly our local school districts, to be able to make those sorts of changes as well. That means changes in what was once called the QEO, but some sort of wage and benefit control. It means changes in mediation and arbitration. Uh, again, having a process where you go to arbitration, where the only comparable is another level of government. You know, these days we see it more than ever. You, you can't have three, four, five percent increases at a time when everybody else in town is having a pay freeze just to keep jobs. Uh, that's got to be factored in there as well. There's got to be a moratorium on all new unfunded mandates in local governments, and I'd seek to repeal those that are existing there, at least those that are not funded. And then finally, we need to be creative in ways like allowing our local governments to buy into the state employee health care plan. Uh, those are things that overall, for all local governments, would save us approximately $300 million if they all took advantage of that. Those are ways of able, being able to control costs, but doing it in a way that still protects uh, core services. Those are the sorts of things we're going to highlight and focusing in on, on balancing this next budget and doing it in a way that really helps us in future budgets as well. But again, I look out at this crowd and I see so many people who have been involved uh, either directly in government or indirectly, and I'm going to ask you one more time just like I did with the jobs initiative. I'm going to need your help. You know, we talk about a lot of folks here work with health care. Uh, there are ways we can be innovative and aggressive when it comes to Medicaid and still do it in ways that protect our core safety net. I'm going to need your help and the help of those that you work with. Uh, when I look at other issues uh, facing this next, next stage budget, I'm going to need your help and your innovation and your creativity as well. We've got plenty of ideas. We already had people starting to work with it as of Wednesday last week when I got my briefings. But this is something where we're going to be reaching out. Uh, what I've learned as county executive, you're better off if you reach out as opposed to entrenching in to find some of the best and brightest ideas out there. And so uh, I guess that's my charge is I give you a little update today. I'm off to Madison uh, to meet with those caucuses and a little bit later today to meet with Governor Doyle who I should add, just as one final parting thought, uh, has been incredibly gracious to me since Tuesday night. Governor Doyle was one of the first calls I received. Uh, Jessica, Mrs. Doyle, has talked to my wife already as of last week. Uh, the governor's talked to me a couple times on the phone. Obviously, we have our political differences issue by issue, uh, but I really cannot say enough about Governor Doyle's commitment, of both of himself and of his cabinet, to make this a smooth transition. Uh, I know he cares deeply about the state just as I do, just as you all do, and, and I have every reason to believe that we're going to have a great transition, and I appreciate that very much uh, on behalf of not just myself, but of the people of this state. So thank you to Governor Doyle for that as well. Thank you very much for the time. We'll let you get back to your panel, and have a great lunch.